starve for entertainment, humor, and meaning. Two brave best friends set out on an epic quest to combine their love of improv comedy, movies, and storytelling to create a show that defies the odds and redefines cinematic genius. Dude, it's just a podcast where we use short-form improv games to tell long-form improv stories in the style of famous movies. Right. You're listening to In a World of Improvised Movie Homages. I'm your co-host, Avish Parashar, and I'm an improv comedian and a professional speaker. And I'm your co-host, Mike Worth, and I'm an improv comedian and professional film and video game composer. We both love improv, movies, and storytelling, along with getting a little bit silly and ridiculous. And hey, if you also like these things, then you are in the right place, because that's what this show is all about. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of In a World of Improvised Movie Homages. This is Avish, I'm here with Mike. Hello. Mike, how are you today? I'm great, Avish. I am ready to rock and roll, man. It's a beautiful Saturday morning here and life is good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. I'm excited about today and then the genre and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with it and yeah so it's nice to this yeah, is definitely like this improv this is definitely bringing back uh shades of my nerdy childhood the uh, genre we're going to be playing with you know because it's oh yeah oh yeah so, this is a great stuff i'm gonna i'm gonna relive my eight-year-old saturday morning kid with this thing oh yeah absolutely so before we get into letting you know what the genre is if you're listening to this without actually reading the title uh, <laughs> Uh, if you're and listening you to are. our show for the first time, <laughs> uh, here's how it works. Mike and I love improv, movies, and storytelling, so we combine them into one show. We're going to improvise a full movie for you in audio format, uh, but we'll tell the story by playing a series of improv comedy games. And we're going to start with a genre or example movie that we're going to... Our movie will basically be an homage to. Then this show is broken into four segments. Uh, first... We spend about five minutes discussing the tropes, cliches, and commonalities of that genre. Then we spend five minutes hashing out a high-level outline uh, for today's show. Then we're going to spend five minutes picking which improv game we will play for each act of the movie. So to act out each act, we play a different improv game. And finally, once that's all set, we perform the show. So to begin, uh, Mike, why don't you let everybody know what today's... uh, genre is it would be my pleasure avish uh so today's genre is a um kind of an interesting one because it's related to my childhood but also brand new mystical martial arts or mystical kung fu movie in the style of uh the wu assassins which i've not seen but avish has or the marvel iron fist show or the upcoming uh shang chi and the uh, legend of the ten rings or whatever it is so yeah so it's it's yeah. uh it's like modern martial arts so not like you know where you're in like feudal Japan or China or whatever, like the the old right. Shaw Brothers movies are. Oh, uh, the Shaw Brothers, <laughs> which I'm sure is a genre we will visit at some point. We need to at some Kung point. We, we need yeah, to. Yeah, but this is like like Mike said, this is the modern one. So, uh, for the the full long alliterative genre, I believe is modern Marvel mystical martial arts movie. Perfect. Can't think of a better way to describe this. <laughs> and if we are timing this right, uh, this episode will drop right around the time that Shang Chi. And The Legend of the Ten Rings, uh, the Marvel movie, is releasing. We'll see how organized we are. Uh, But that's the basic gist. Um, So that is our genre. We're about to get started. Before we do, just a quick little reminder. Our website is avishandmike.com, A-V-I-S-H-A-N-D-M-I-K-E.com. Be sure to check us out there. And when you're there, there will be some links where you can uh, click over to our show, subscribe to this podcast, leave a review or rating. That helps people find us. Um, and you can add your own suggestions for future genres on the website as well. Yes. All right, Mike, are you ready to begin? I am. I've got my pencil. I've got my water. I've got my Zoom link. <laughs> That's everything right, I need. Here we go. Segment one, discussing the tropes. All right, so now we're going to spend five minutes chatting about the genre tropes and cliches and things. Uh, so I got my duck timer, and away we go. Yeah, baby. All right, Mike, feel free to kick us off. When you think of this modern martial arts mystical movie, 
Um, what are some of the things that come to mind? So what comes to mind right off the bat, we've got one main character, and the main character uh, usually has no knowledge of his hidden potential. Let's, there's a couple ways you can do it, but I like that one. He's like you know kind of a chosen one, and so it's the main character, no knowledge of his hidden potential, and he is kind of called to adventure usually by a mentor figure, right? That shows mm-hmm. up and is like, turns out you have this power, and you know you have to rise to the challenge, and blah blah blah, kind of thing. Um, the and in yeah. true hero's journey fashion, he always refuses that call first. Like yes. he doesn't believe the person, or even if he realizes it, then he doesn't want it, so he kind of tries to walk away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now uh, we're you, we're saying he, which for us it probably will be, but it could be a it could be a, could girl, be a female girl. as well, like Buffy or whatever, you know. Yeah, 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 so. exactly. Um, okay, there's a couple of ways to go with it. Uh, what can be fun, and we can play this one is it's it could be someone from the West that that then is like trained by like an Eastern mentor kind of thing. Um, or you could just go with the traditional, like if it's done in China or in Hong Kong, everything's, you know, it's all, they're all native to that region. There is a bad guy. The bad guy is off. He, yeah, he's often also a martial arts dude, wizard. Oh, I, yeah, I think the bad guy, yeah, is always a martial artist. You have the big martial arts fight. Right. And I would say the bad guy is either, um, either has a similar power, um, you know, like the yin yang type thing, yeah, or yeah. <clears throat> wants the hero's power, you know, like, like, oh, you've got the iron fist, but the bad guy wants the iron fist. So if I kill you, I'll get the iron fist. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. So they are also mystical. Now, the question is, um, here's, there's two tropes to this. One is there's a training element where this guy has to learn to, has to learn to, to harness the power, and there's kind of like a, a, a Rocky esque moment, you know, usually as much philosophical as it is physical, or it's like his power emerges from him completely ready to go as like the ancestral energies course through him. You know what I mean? Almost like he uh, inherits the skill of his 10,000 warrior ancestors and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And and a lot of times it, the person may already be a martial artist, just not a mystical martial artist. They've already got a lot of like the training and stuff in place. Yeah. But then all of a sudden the the chosen oneness comes out and then they become ultra badass. Right, right. Um from I mean, from a storytelling standpoint, we can decide depending on the improv game and stuff. I think storytelling wise it's usually a little easier to not have the training sequence cuz that doesn't really ever progress the story. It just sort of is development, but we can kind of decide. You know, when we get to the you, outline. You know what's yeah. funny? Do you know what technically is a mystical martial arts movie? Highlander. Yeah, I guess that is. It's you, like, you, it's technically like a little western, right? Yeah. So this ties in with this trope. There's almost always an earthly detective element to this. Like this, there's this is like this battle is happening in our world, but like beneath it. So there's almost always like there's always yeah a cop or someone who is investigating these mysterious things you know yeah they had that Highlander that had it in uh, in Wu Assassins there's one I think in, in Iron Fist uh, well, they I haven't have seen it. Shang-Chi yet but I'm assuming there'll be some yeah they, they have, have every man yep yep I mean they they had in Highlander they had uh what's her face the uh, Brenda the, uh, the yeah the gun the expert investigator person um what do you think what is the ultimate quest of the bad guy it's either trying to get the power. Again, going back to Highlander or, or Iron Fist, or it's a quest for MacGuffin. If it's a quest for MacGuffin, a lot of times the hero is the protector of the MacGuffin. Yeah, the hero is the protector of the MacGuffin, but without even knowing it, like the MacGuffin is like part of their spirit or soul inside of them, or it's like this medallion they have and they don't realize that medallion that was passed down from to their parents is yeah, the yeah, yeah. MacGuffin. You're about but yeah, to I think you combine it too. I feel like. I feel like the bad guys in a lot of these, their their ultimate goal is power slash ascension. It's like, oh well, if I can kill you and take your soul or get your medallion, MacGuffin, you know, then I can become the god of blah blah blah. You know, I can rise that level of power. I can become the the chosen, the highlight. Right, right. Like Big Trouble in Little China, except that didn't have the mystical assassin dude. Oh my God, He Man is this as well. <laughs> Jesus, like everything is He-Man, mystical. Yeah. Big Trouble in Little China is very is. I mean. It didn't have the martial arts. It was all, all mystical. It had like the the Asian friend was like them. That's very legit. much a mystical martial arts movie. Jesus, man. And same thing, right? Little Pan wanted the girl with the green eyes to get immortality. Like, immortality yeah, is a big yeah. one of these. Yep, yep. Is there a love interest in this? There can be. It's, it's not essential. There usually is. For our movies, it may or may not be necessary, but there, I feel like there's usually a romantic interest in there. I mean, probably romance is always interesting between two guys. <laughs> and two dudes. All right. <laughs> so that's our five-minute timer. The only other thing I'd add is obviously there's uh, – 
there's there's fights and henchmen and martial arts. Oh yeah, the, the, like he's got to when he gets into Act Two, which will go in the next one, he's gonna be chewing through bad guys. That's half the fun, you know, is him just like. Yeah, which is gonna be interesting to convey in an improv audio format, but you know. I think I have an idea for a game. <laughs> All right, then. All right, so that is our first segment. So now, segment two, creating the outline. All right, now we're going to spend about five minutes uh, hashing out our outline for this movie. We are going to, um, we use a four-act structure, which is like a three-act structure. We just split act two into a first half and second half. It flows a little better. It's uh, a little easier Story for Engineering, games. which eventually we'll have a link, an affiliate link to buy from our website. Oh, yeah, Story uh, Engineering. That's a great, oh, my God, yeah. That's a great um, <laughs> buy stuff. And, <laughs> and, and disclaimer here is we're going to come up with the outline for our story here. The, because this is improv and short form improv where things get wacky and crazy, we may veer from it, but this is our kind of starting point and lifeline. So, for five minutes begins now. All right. So we always begin with either a prologue or movie trailer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Uh, What are you feeling? I know what I'm feeling. uh, For this kind of mystical thing, a prologue often works. Yes, sir. Oh, Studio Dog has arrived. He votes for the prologue as well. All right, so we'll do a prologue, and that will usually not involve the hero at all. Usually it's like the bad guy. You kind of meet the bad guy. And you learn a little bit about what they're after. Yep, and you learn if there's a MacGuffin, you usually see the MacGuffin, right? That kind of yeah. thing. You, you know, the, the the stage is set in a Shakespearean context. Yeah. Okay, so that's prologue. Yeah. All right. So in Act One, we obviously meet the hero. Yep. We're doing prologue. I just I just deleted it from our uh, thing. Meet the hero, and we are let's follow the hero's journey. And he is truly ordinary. Meaning he might be a martial arts, but he's like it's like a normal dude, you know. Just yeah, yeah. He has a, a, a an apartment, a little. Uh, yeah, know. he's got a yeah, he's got an apartment. He's a musician. He does Brazilian jiu jitsu. He you know uh, just he's boxing just, on the side at times. Off, off top of your head, a completely fantastic person that would never really exist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Call to adventure. Uh, what's so, happening here? Yeah, he, I I think, and this is especially if you want a romance interest. I feel like in Act One somehow he gets involved there's there's like a fight scene where he does something you know mystical without realizing it or he's like what the hell happened the mentor comes and oftentimes not for his fight scene the romance interest there like he rescues her from bad guys or whatnot because the romance interest sometimes is an outside observer or the cop and sometimes it's like it's like the damsel in distress like oh they're after the princess or you know yeah, um, and then let, let's get real. But obvious he refuses here. the call, and then something happens that forces well, him to. It's really easy. The stakes are raised because guess what? He refuses the call. Then guess what? Bad guy shows up trying to get him. Yeah. And now the hero, maybe the mentor shows up and gets the hero away. Now we've entered the special world. You know, the stakes raised. Bad guy shows up. I mean, I'm I'm typing it in here. We're, I'm drilling a little bit in, but it's kind of following the hero's journey pretty pretty easily. The refuse of the call. Yeah, then he the has stakes to, are raised. The turning point. We have to accept the call. Yep. Bad guy shows up and makes trouble. Uh, put and puts hero in danger. Cool. So a- right. Act One ends with literally that crossing the threshold. He and the mentor, if they flee or they they temporarily defeat the bad guy, and he yeah. accepts the call. Or to he's going to lose, but the mentor comes and saves him, and then yeah, and then he accepts the call to adventure. Yeah, yeah. Which in another another two movies that are in this genre are both Mortal Kombat and the new Mortal Kombat. You know, right. Very much. Right. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what happens in Mortal Kombat. Like Raiden comes and saves him. That's what forces him to be like. I love how we now reference several movies with Christopher Lambert. <laughs> this is fantastic. <laughs> we do need a whole Christopher Lambert genre as our. You should do a Lambert movie. genre. <laughs> All right, so we have the prologue. So in Act One, so in Act Two, um, so this is like the reactive where they're kind of learning, um, about what, what the bad guys want. They're investigating. They're probably on the run a little bit. Yep. Um, Either on the run or in hiding. Yeah. Just like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh my God. This is <laughs> from the 80s. Yeah, they're all there, man. They're all there. He says, This is great. I'm, I'm falling in love with this genre. Uh, and then, of course, this is when the hero has to learn to develop his powers. Um, yeah, if there's going to be training, it's going to be here. And he gets his powers. Okay. He How- probably loses something here. Like he, like he probably beats henchmen, but maybe loses a fight to the main bad guy. Yeah. Like manages to get away. Yeah. Maybe he's like, Oh, I think maybe in Act Two, even though he's accepted the call, he hasn't like fully embraced his destiny. So he's like trying to do things his own way, but then he gets in a fight and realizes 
like, oh crap, my way is not going to work. You know, you know what could happen here? Uh, um, the, again, there's there's some sort of MacGuffin thing. There's maybe an early conflict where the hero tries to stop an element of the bad guy's plans, beats the henchman, but the bad guy achieves the plan and defeats the hero. But the bad guy's goal wasn't to like defeat the hero. It, you know, let's say the bad guy like I don't know had to get a gem from a. He's trying to build a spell and like there's a gem. The hero goes and like defends the gem against the henchman, but loses to the big bad guy. Right, and I'd say usually the hero is kind of like cocky or arrogant and then mm-hmm. like there's like the humbling moment where he's like he thought he did good beat the henchman but it's like oh no and then he's like all right i gotta really listen to you know master raiden and do what he wants right, right. so that's act two uh at this point in time also usually the uh, the the investigative comes in too um because whatever he's doing or has done in act one or in act two is gets the 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 attention of the police and stuff like that so that yeah that. all right so <clears throat> That that kind of is act two is a pretty passive act in terms of he's just growing as a hero and stuff like that. Yeah, and there's like a little bit of action scene there. So act yeah. three is the. Oops, sorry. Right. Keep going. Right, we we reserve the right to spend. Finish up. Yeah, yeah. Act three. It's our show. Damn it, we're not going to stop it. I don't care. Yet. Um. So <laughs> in act three, this is more proactive. So he's actively trying to stop the bad guy here. Right. Um, the uh. This is where the bad guy will do two things. He will up the stakes in dissuading the hero from interfering, and that will cause the hero to even more intently want to defeat him. This is usually where the love interest gets kidnapped. Yeah, that's like how the act ends a lot of times. It's like yeah. Because what the, what the bad guy is doing is basically he's like, doing stay away, I've got your girlfriend. And that, of course, makes the hero want to get him even more, right? Yeah, um, act, I think on this time, like, they – it kind of succeeds in doing what it needs to to stop the bad guy, but then the bad guy kind of one ups him by, yeah, kidnapping or threatening something. So he has to like, you know, they like get the gem first, but then the bad guy shows up and is like, oh, if you don't give me the gem, I'm gonna you know kill all these people. And then they're like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and then usually at this point is when the mentor, if they die, the mentor sacrifices himself here. But the mentor doesn't always die. The mentor doesn't always have to do but that. They, but if they don't die, they disappear. Like they get captured or. Or like a, another modern martial arts mystical, uh, Remo Williams. You know, <gasps> That's when, uh, right. <laughs> when Chun sort of dies, but then he comes. Then it turns out he's alive at the end because you know he's Chun. <laughs> so, right. right. <laughs> but yeah, the the hero the hero loses his like safety net. The mentor is gone. You know, ben Kenobi is now dead. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, safety net's gone. And then Act Four is the kind of final confrontation resolution. Yep. This is a, a final uh, like a loads of fight. This is just a good old fashioned. Loads of fighting. Um, this is literally like the the old game, uh, the dun, 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 the karate game, where you yeah. have to go up the five levels of the temple. This is game of death. Like he just he's just ascending, yeah, uh, just through chewing, guys. Yep, chewing through the henchmen. Um, and usually, if if depending how we establish the characters, the and sometimes the romance interest and the investigative cop are the same person. Sometimes they're different. But if we're gonna have multiple threads running, then you know the the love interest who was kidnapped can have some agency and escape and do her thing. And the cop can be working the angle from his or her side. And then yep, everything yep. kind of coalesces at the end. There's often a timed danger fight at the end where he's fighting the head bad guy, you know, like uh, there's a, a doomsday clock going. Or oh yeah. But if yeah. he doesn't stop it by, by the time the moon yeah. rises, then right, right, right. Or like when the conjunction happens, uh, the hero assumes the final form and defeats the villain. This, you know, he, he comes into his true power. Uh, and then the oh, he- that's true. That's the kind of the final trope slash in the outline. There's usually some mental block. There's some reason. There's something stopping the hero from embracing their full, Potential. their full oneness. And you know, yeah. usually it's like insecurity, which I think is kind of lame. But you know, usually it's some mental block or something they don't realize is preventing them from. Totally. And so they assume the final form and defeat the villain. And then the hero, you know, becomes the new protector of the uh, MacGuffin, or you know, because he's there's there's always some sort of protecting element or. or like, this isn't more like he's becoming a crime fighter. He really is, like, supposed to be, like, a protector or something. Yeah. So that or, in theory, in- until the sequel, you know, he saved the world, and he's, like, free to live his life. He's like, I have... Yeah, know, yeah, yeah. He's a Highlander until destiny. you realize that they're all aliens, and... <laughs> right, and then my, and Michael Ironside decides to show up, because... Exactly. Because why not? You always improve a movie, but not that one. That's you proud of Michael Ironside. So <laughs> I think we've got a nice little outline, um, yep. which brings us now to... Segment three choosing the games 
So now we're going to spend about five minutes uh, picking the improv games. We've got one prologue and four acts. So for each of those, we are going to pick one improv game that we're going to play yep. to tell that part of the story or act out that part of the movie. Um, a couple quick things. If you are unfamiliar with the games, I will do a quick explanation. Um, certainly at the end of this segment, a quick kind of summary of what each game is. So let's our five minutes starts now. All right. Uh, so we can we can pass on the prologue and get back to that in a sec if you want, unless you have a strong one that you want yeah. to do. No, we can we can pass on that. Catherine's leaving for summer camp. Well, uh, yeah, let's go right to Act One here. All right, so Act One. This is a little bit of a we're meeting a lot. There's a little bit of action, but it's a lot of like meeting the different people. Yeah, we need a scene um, game. Yeah, let's get the games list up here, and I would say A to Z. Maybe A to Z is you know that's that's always a solid one to progress a, a story. Um, Emotional switching could be a good one too. Like emotional list could be a good one. Yeah, emotional list could be good. You want to, you want to start with that one? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Or emotional lists, and I'll explain what all these are when we get to it. All right. So then, Act Two. Um, this is gonna be more. It's gonna be reactive, but they're gonna be on the run. They're gonna, you know, potentially try to do something but fail. Or okay. succeed, but realize they did it wrong. I have a cool idea because it'd be really funny to do the trading montage this way. Uh, he said, she said. Oh yeah, okay. He yeah. said, she said. Yep, and we can and we can we can do our thing we do where we can jump into narrator mode and further the scene along as a narrator. So we only do he said, she said when there's dialogue between yeah. uh, characters, right? Because because we, we'll want there's going to be several scenes happening. There. We're going to see the the bad guy the henchman and the mentor and the hero. So we'll, we'll jump in narrator mode. What yeah. We'll jump in and out of there. So yeah, you like that? I do like that. That is a nice little choice. All right, let's, uh, so for act three, then this is where <laughs> they attempt to stop the plan. Um, they may even succeed, but then bad things happen. Let's yeah. Safety net is gone. See if we can pick one that maybe we haven't done in a while. I feel like. Where's that list of the ones that you haven't done? You haven't like thoughts. Uh, yeah. That's in that prep play? document. Let's see. Word. Which one is that one? Four letter word is one where we pick a word, um, like a four letter word, and then each subsequent sentence has to have a one word variation on the last word. So if it was, um, that. if it was like that, um, you know, you say, oh, he didn't like that. What he didn't like was because that's like switching the T to a W, right? And then, right. Uh, and and then the next sentence has to have uh, a change, change from what, what to, to, to wait one letter to what to like. And then he went whap and hit him in the face. Oh yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, I don't know. It's you a it's it's a good game. It's a little bit of a slower narrative game, I think. It's oh. like more of a storytelling game. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do an act three. Uh, or that could be a good game for the prologue because that's like it's like yes. storytelling. Let's do four letter word for the prologue. Okay, four letter word for prologue. Yeah, that's, good, that's there you go. See solving problems of each. And just jumping ahead. Act four, we usually do cutting room because that's a great way to Especially for wrap this everything up. Yeah, it's going to be, you know. So I think for act three, we need like a good, like, faster, higher energy game because the, well, they can all be funny. Four letter word emotionless, he said, she said, all, you know, could be a little bit slower. Yeah. Like yeah. energy wise. Uh, what do we So think let's here? get a good. Oh, dear listeners, which one should we do? We need a high energy one. Blind line. Blind line could be fun. Yeah, blind line for sure. Blind line's got good energy. I feel like ding, we've just done a lot, so I'm trying to mix it up. But it is it is your game from your um, from your other job. I mean, it is a great game, but I think I'd rather go with something else. Time styles was kind of fun, and that could be good for like quick hits. Um, Yeah, time styles where we have three minutes and we each do like a six sentence. Um, thing but in a different style like we've done it not as replays but like um continue the narrative continue the narrative but with like a new obstacle or a different genre or a different uh, uh way so it can be fast that can Let's be fun. See. yeah so i say we pick one of those two which are you in the mood for a uh, blind line or time styles i, don't know. I feel a like blind line was resonating with you a little more like you were kind of um vibing yeah let's do blind 
line. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, that's just about the end of our five minutes. So to quick recap, here's what we're going to do. For our prologue, we're going to play an improv game called Four Letter Word, where we pick a four-letter word, and we're going to tell a story one sentence at a time. The first sentence has to have that word in it. The next person, when they speak, their sentence has to have that word, but with one letter changed. So if it was um, live, then the next person would have the word life, you know, changing this uh, V to an F. The next person could have the word wife and then so on, and so on. Um, then for act one, we're going to do emotional lists, which is where um, we'll be acting out the scene at any point. Either of us can call it an emotion, and the characters in that scene will take on that emotion. Mm-hmm. Then he said, she said, where we're going to be doing a scene, Mike and I. But um, after Mike says his line of dialogue, I will first say he said or she said, depending on the character. And then give a uh a stage direction and then respond with my line so kind of forces action blind line where periodic will be acting out a scene and periodically we will pause and uh i have a list of of cards i've gotten over the years for my speaking gigs that have quotes and sentences written on them so i'll call that out and then we'll have to immediately incorporate that and then finally cutting room where we will start with a scene but then cut to different parts um, of the story cut to the future the past and other areas all right, does that all make enough sense for us to get started? Yeah, baby. <clears throat> Excellent. So we just have a, <laughs> <All right then. laughs> one final thing to set up before we start, and that is the title for our modern Marvel mystical martial arts movie. Right. Um, and we like to do this using one word at a time. So um, you want to give us the first word for our title? Sure. Yeah, we're going to do one word at a time. I'm going to start with this. Uh, okay. Um all right, here we go. Um, David and the mystical sphere of destiny. All right. I think we're going to have a mystical sphere of destiny in this show. <laughs> a mystical MacGuffin. The uh, mystical David. I should have done that. David and the mystical MacGuffin. Uh, that would have been great. All, all right. right, we have all of our elements, so we are just about ready to start the show. Uh, before we do, quick reminder, everyone, please uh, head over to our website or to your favorite podcast app, subscribe to our podcast, and leave us a five star rating. And if you're so inclined, a short review really helps our show grow. Really helps other people find us. All right. Are you ready? Yes, sir. <laughs> so that brings us to segment four, showtime. All right, so we are going to begin, David, and the mystical sphere of destiny <laughs> with a <laughs> prologue using the improv game four-letter word where we're going to act out kind of the villain and the sphere of destiny. So we, we need to start a, a four-letter word. Uh, to begin this, and you know what's interesting about the internet is they can uh, generate anything you want. So, the internet's a mystical. Let's start. We want one that's going to have a good like base. So, um, how about um, bone? Bone. B O N E. Yep. All right. So the first sentence someone says has to start with the word has to have the word bone in it. The next person is going to have to change one letter of bone. Um, and put that word in their sentence, and whatever word that is, the next person is going to have to change one letter of that using their sentence, and right. so on. This game should be pretty short. It's just the prologue. And uh, this rule applies whether we're in narrator mode or character mode, so we still have to use, you know, you can't get out of it if we switch, switch into narrator mode. Right, because this is a story, not a scene, so yeah, this is... Cool. All right, uh, I'm going to go first with Bone, okay? Is that, is that, is that if, I go, if I go yep, first? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> oh, I'm going to be in full narrator mode. The camera pans up showing a cave flickering with candles and torches all centered around a single bone jutting out of the ground. Walking towards the bone is a mighty booted man who is almost seven feet tall, giant monster. And then he speaks to the bone with a intense and ominous tone. 
It has been far too long for me to have waited this long. And now I am here to claim what is rightfully... Uh, uh, to... Rightfully mine to acquire. I, lone warrior, shall finally get the mystical sphere of destiny. He takes his hands, plunges them deep into the earth under the bone, and says, I have waited such a long time for this, but wait, it's not here! You are correct. You are correct, Faustus, as the old mentor walks out, gently singing a song to himself as he walks confidently towards the seven-foot-tall warrior. Oh, Himnal, you would approach me here in my land. You don't realize how... <laughs> Crap, I'm trying to go. I don't... <laughs> You have a song. You your can room. sing to your heart's content, but without the one to hear your song, you are powerless, old man. Himnal skirted to the side uh, and, and lifted his hand in a fluttering gesture like that of a wing. Oh, Faustus, we've been doing this dance throughout generations. It's time you understood that everything comes to an end including your quest for the sacred sphere. I have found the person who will finally be able to protect it from the likes of you. Huh. Your words ring hollow, old man, for now you have tipped your hat. You know, now I know that you have found your chosen one. I know who I must destroy. And I know that deep inside of him is the mystical sphere of destiny, which will allow me to ascend to godhood. Faust just pulls a rind of cantaloupe from his uh, pocket, chomps it quickly, and then suddenly orange energy burns within him as he pulls his mighty blade and lunges quicker than thought at Hymnal, the old man standing in the middle of the cave with his staff. Hymnal smiles and disappears into a puff of smoke, appearing on the other side just as the blade would have gone through him, says to Faustus, Don't mind me, Faustus. We will meet again, and when we do, your quest for the Spirit of Destiny will indeed be over, but not in the way you would like. With a poof, Hymnal disappears into the night, leaving Faustus standing alone in the cave. Faustus raises his sword to, to the heavens, inverts it, and slams it into the ground, waves of rippling energy. Hymnal! This sphere shall be mine! Mark my words! As the camera pulls out, rippling tomes of magical energy flourishing outside the cave, leading to orange fire sparkling into the wilderness. And that was a fine way to end that story. <laughs> that was and legit! There you go. <laughs> Holy shit, that's a hard game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We actually were able to improv an epic quick moment of battle, complete with uh, mystical teleportation and uh, earth energy. And there you go. <laughs> powered, so by powered by cantaloupes. Powered by cantaloupes. So endeth the prologue. Faustus and Hymnal. Faustus, our villain. Hymnal, our mentor. This takes us to, we're going to uh, being act one, where we'll meet our hero in their ordinary world. We'll yes. be acting this out, playing an improv game called Emotional Lists, where Mike and I will be doing the scene work, and then at any point, either of us can call out an emotion slash mental state, mood, whatever. And uh, the characters and the energy of the scene will take on that emotion and we'll keep switching. Now, two things. In any improv game we play, number one, uh, Mike and I may end up playing the same character at different times. So if Mike in one scene is playing Faustus, later on it may work out where I play Faustus. So we'll try to keep the vocal cues clear for who's playing what. Yeah. Number two, in our scene-based games at any point, uh, one of us can jump out in narrator mode um, to either describe action or to jump to a different scene. Maybe want to change where we are. Um, and usually when we do those, those don't have to conform to the rule of the game. So if we're going to do a narration, it doesn't have to be like sad if that's the emotion. So the narration right, right. is kind of independent. In true cinematic form, we can, you know, jump to a fantastically cool parallel scene and dive back into the story. Exactly. All right. So now we begin act when we'll start with no emotion. We'll just start with a basic scene. Uh, act one, 
of David and the mystical sphere of destiny. Our story begins as we zoom in on a diner with a mild looking um, busboy clearing tables, keeping his head down, not making contact with anyone. Ding, 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 ding. David, David, we got two more of the orders coming out here. Fried eggs and Scrapple. Drop them off at tables two and three. All right, yes, I got it here. <sighs> David quickly moves um, and without missing a beat, picks up both plates and drops them off at the proper tables. Um, hey, thanks so much, David. I appreciate it. Hey, listen, when, uh, when are you going to get back to the, uh, to the dojo, man? I haven't seen you in the last couple of weeks. Uh, uh, Thomas, you know, I'm taking a break from my training. I, uh, just, just, just busy here with work and, you know, I'm, uh, I'm taking night classes studying to get my, uh, my law degree. So, uh, I, I love training with you. Um, but, uh, it's just so busy, you know? Oh man, listen, I know, I know you think the law degree is going to get you, get you out of this whole life that you had with your parents, stuff like that. But I'm telling you, man, there are more important things than just kind of getting a paycheck. I mean, you got a good group over at the dojo, man. You got a bunch of guys that like you. You should make sure it's some time for them. We all miss you. Excitement. You all miss me. That's, that's so great to hear. I thought you guys hated me because I used to beat everyone in sparring all the time. I thought I, I was staying away. Oh my God. The guy you guys like, I've never had friends because I was always better than everyone at martial arts. Oh no, 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 no. We're super excited to watch you look inspire us to get better and everything. It's fantastic. In fact, I think if you want, we can arrange to have some of our, of our team there tonight. So why don't you come back after studying and we'll have like a big old reunion party that we haven't seen in a couple of weeks. It'll be great. Oh my God, I would love to. If I can finish my, if I can finish the paper I need to write for school, I will be there. I'll beat you all up and then we can party. It would be great. Ding, ding, ding. Dave, Dave, guess what? I just delivered 15 plates in like a minute. This is fantastic. I'm super excited. Quick, get out the tables as fast as possible because I'm going to make okay, more money. I'll do that right now. <laughs> Confused. Suddenly, the cling of the door comes in uh, as a woman walks in with a severe look and, you know, a beautiful but severe look and looks and says, Excuse me, are you David? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I don't believe I've ever met you before. Uh, can I ask what your name is? Um, I don't know. I There was just a man outside, and he told me, um, he did some, I don't know, I'm not sure what happened. I, I looked at him, and all I know is that when I stopped talking to him, I just had this compelling urge to come in here and find someone named David. Oh, well, I, I strange, I never... Never had anybody do this before. This is kind of strange. Thomas, do you have any idea of what's going on here? Mm, this is very weird for me. Um, uh, sedated. Well, um, if you are David, um, maybe I could just sit and you can go out and, and talk to this guy, I guess. Sure, man. Uh, gee, it's not a problem there. I'll just here take these 15 plates and just people can come get them themselves, you know, because I have been working way too hard and way too long. I'll go up front and see what's going on. You can just sit here and chill. Fear. Um, okay, I'm going to stay here, but I got a bad feeling about this. That guy, I mean, anyone who can put a whammy on someone, like, are you sure you want to go out there by yourself? That seems really dangerous. Us, and I'm really not happy about this at all, but I'd rather be outside where I can see all my avenues of fight or flight than be tucked in here in the diner. David walks out on the front do on the front into the bright uh, uh, street of the uh, urban neighborhood that he's in. It's late, late morning, and he sees an old shrouded man wearing a cloak and a hat pulled down low standing near. Silly. <laughs> David! David Ohm? Yes, yes, it's me. <laughs> and, and and who are you? And who will you be? I am the answer to your prayers, David Ohm. Come, come closer to me. I have something to show you. Oh, fantastic! Maybe it's the maybe it's help with my new logs exam that's coming up in a little bit. Let me take a look here, David. Wait, okay, go for it. Well, I was gonna go ahead. Emotion. Um. Uh. Uh. Mysterious. David slowly moves towards the old man who reaches out his hand and it the fingertips start to glow. What? What is that? What's going on with your hands, man? I don't understand. <laughs> All will be revealed as soon as you touch the conduit. Come, become one with this conduit and all shall be answered. Um, okay, I just really want to know what that's about, so I guess I'll do that. Uh, panicked. 
Suddenly, as the hands touch, the old man's hand turns and grabs. Orange energy starts coursing through, and David becomes immobilized. Ha, 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 ha. The man starts to swell and grow in size, suddenly becoming six foot five, six foot eight, seven feet tall. Oh my God, what are you? David uses his martial arts and punches hard, the man hard in the chest over and over, but to no avail. Oh my God, is that working? <laughs> That's right. Now you know the true destiny of yours is only to feed my destiny. Having said this, the man pulls out a small rind of cantaloupe and begins <laughs> chomping it with one hand as he twists David's arm towards the breaking point. Ah! Hearing this commotion, the woman from inside the diner comes running out. Oh my God, he's killing him. That's the man. Help, someone help. Won't someone help us? Energetic. <laughs> Suddenly, a crash of lightning and a wisp of smoke, and an old man who looks suspiciously like Himnal appears. Oh, <laughs> Faustus, you are breaking the rules. Approaching David too soon. Try and stop me, old man. R rules were made to be broken. He raises it. Faustus raises his fist back, aiming it directly at David's head. The fist whistles towards David's skull. David, quick! Use movement number five from kata number eight. David quickly whips around and spins to the left, the fist narrowly missing his face. He stumbles back, and the grip is broken. As he, as he falls backward and Faustus jumps towards him, suddenly this old man jumps in front with a staff. Whipping it at Faustus's legs, he, he clips Faust, who drops to one knee. Spinning over, he smashes it down on Faustus's head, which Faustus blocks with uh, his left forearm. Angry. Old man, you have interfered in my business one too many times. I was just going to kill David, but now I'm going to kill you first, and then David, and everyone in this city before I ascend. The old man steps back with his staff whipping through the air. You've now threatened the city that I live in. Do you realize how much this pisses me off? <laughs> <laughs> he strides towards the man with his staff whipping back and forth in a chaotic pattern and frenzy of motion. Meanwhile, David scrambles back on the ground and starts yelling, what are you guys doing? You're messing everything up. The woman from the diner comes over to make sure that David is okay. 80s seductive saxophone emotion. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. God. Are you okay? <laughs> I, I, I am now. I am so sorry. I don't know. I feel like this fog is clearing from mine. I'm so sorry. I don't know why I brought you out there. That guy did something to me. Well, I don't know what brought you over here, but I'm certainly glad that we finally met. I'm David. I'm Sandy. <laughs> Sandy. What a beautiful name. <laughs> Ominous. So, Faustus, we, as always, are at an impasse. But we will meet again. And when we do, David will be ready for you. Hmm. We shall see if David is ready for... We, we shall see about that, because David needs to be ready for far more than me. Faustus steps back, takes his hand, and slams it on the ground. A huge explosion of orange fire shows up, swirling around, and when it goes, when it dissipates, Faustus is gone. Uh, Himnal looks at the uh, Sandy and David. Come, there's much work to do. And see. Wow. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So it ends act one of David and the mystical sphere of destiny with Faustus attempting to attack David, but being saved by him. Null. And then we've introduced Sandy. I feel like I literally was just DMing like a D and D fight scene. Like that's what I was getting into. I was like, I had to like describe everything, you know, like, <laughs> Hey, you know, that Dungeons and Dragons nerdery would pay off eventually. So. God, thank God it did. <laughs> All right. So now we move to act two of our story where we are going to pick up the action where it left off, playing an improv game called He Said, She Said, yes. where um, one of us will say a line of dialogue. When we do, the other person, before they respond, will have to say he said or she said to describe the action that the other person took. So if Mike said, um, hey, here's a cup of coffee, I would say he said, handing a cup of black coffee to Sandy. Right. Oh, thank you so much for this coffee. She said, blah, blah, blah. So pouring cream and sugar into whatever it is. You know? There you go. All right. So he said, she said, and again, we'll play multiple characters and switch back and forth and maybe move. And if we ever go to narrator mode, we suspend the role to do descriptive cinematic stuff. Correct. Yes. All right. Let's pick up act two of David 
and the mystical sphere of destiny. Right. The camera pans up to a deserted warehouse with sunlight streaming through dusty windows. There's a huge open space, a couple of heavy bags hanging, and of course, random Japanese and Chinese art with those little shades that are uh, the little changing thing, right? And, you know, like a bed, and, you know, this is <laughs> 80s 101. There you go. All right, hurry. Come on in, you two, and close the door behind you. He said as he quickly gestured them inside and slid the metal door of the elevator shut. I don't understand this. Who are you and why are you bringing us here? I haven't even had a chance to say goodbye to my friends over at the dojo. David said, flinging down his jacket in frustration and walking towards Hymnal. All will be revealed in due time, but first we need to make sure that you and whoever this person is you brought along is safe. He's, Hymnal said as he quickly opened up a small uh, uh, locket and scanned them with a bright blue gem that cast soothing magical energy around them. I've never seen anything like that. What are you, what are you doing to the two of us with that gem? Uh, David said, moving Sandy protectively uh, behind him. Yeah, and what the hell is going on? What, why, was that fire and you appeared from nowhere and the person hypnotized me? You guys, what is going on here? Sandy said as she caressingly put her right hand on the shoulder of David. <laughs> oh, it's my turn, right? <laughs> what you have just seen is the, the end of a long cycle of war for conquest of the sphere of destiny. Hymnal said, wearily sitting down and putting one he his head in one hand. What? War of Destiny. Look, I'm I'm just a simple busboy studying to be a lawyer. What on earth does this have to do with me? He said as he slowly put his arm around Sandy's waist. <laughs> it has everything to do with you, my young warrior. For you are the last of the protectors of the sphere of destiny. Hymnal said, standing up, ripping open David's shirt and revealing a round symbol um, on David's chest. What? This, this, this is a birthmark. It's just been here my whole life. Why are you, why are you showing uh, this to me? He said, flexing his chest just a little bit. So Sandy can get a look at it. Like, <laughs> That's right. It is your birthmark. It is the birthright of you. You are the last of 10,000 generations of warriors, channeling all of their martial skills and knowledge to defend the sphere of destiny from those who would use it to alter their destiny and control the earth. He said, pulling back one of the screens to reveal a giant mat and training equipment. Wait a minute. You want him to go train right now? This is too much. We're all tired. I think that I think that David and I need to get some rest first. She said, going to the fridge and returning with a bottle of wine <laughs> and two glasses. <laughs> Yes, I, I really think that I, I need some time to digest this all, and I need a little bit of time to talk with someone who's maybe not invested in this bizarre idea of destiny and superheroic and, 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 and ancestral mysticism. David said, taking Sandy's hand and walking back towards a back room. No, there will be time for nookie nookie later. This, <laughs> things are coming to a head. If you don't embrace your destiny, Faustus will win. He will get the sphere of destiny. You and Sandy will both die and the world will end. We must train you now so you understand how to access the sphere on your own. He said, walking towards Dave and swiftly kicking at his legs out from under him with a swipe of the staff, sending David careening to the ground. What? You old man? I'm going to make you pay for that. He said, jumping up in a fighting stance and then launching in the air, throwing a kick at, uh, at Hymnal's head. <laughs> Hymnal's head. Oh, pff, you silly boy. You have so much to learn. Your traditional martial arts can do nothing to me. He said, deftly grabbing his foot from the air, whipping him around and throwing him 20 feet into the training mat area. Kapoop, kapoop, kapoop. That's it, old man. I'm going to show you exactly what I've learned down at the dojo. He said, doing a mighty kip up from the ground and ripping off his shirt all the way so he is unfettered by clothing. <laughs> David, if I don't want to hurt you, but if this is the only way you'll learn, fine. I will show you the true way. He said, walking forward and lightly putting his staff to the ground beside him and gesturing for David to come at him on the training mat. 
<laughs> David grunted unnecessarily in an attempt to look overly macho as he attacked uh, uh, him now. <laughs> this is all you've learned in 25 years of training? <sighs> the fate of the world is doomed! Himnal said as he deftly parried all of David's attack with one hand, stepping back gracefully, moving his head left to right, and and fatiguing David, who's straining to, to hit Himnal and to no avail. How do you move so fast? How are you not... You stand still so I can hit you! David said, lying on the ground, panting and exhausted. She said, running over with a towel and mopping David's sweaty torso. (laughs) Don't you understand, Sandy? The reason he's tired is he's fighting with just the strength of himself. David, you have power within you. Power of the ancestors that came down from China, from Mongolia, and yes, even from Brooklyn, who can help you with speed, timing, and awareness. Himnal said, shaking his head tiredly and starting to walk away. Listen, listen, man. I don't know about all this ancestor stuff. I just know that we just, I just need some time to process this, all right? I, I, I've been training my own way, and I don't know about all this mystical stuff, man. Whatever needs to be done, I'll do it my way. He said, getting up and walking over to the fridge and, and, and grabbing a plate to make himself a sandwich. Come. Bring me that plate and all the others like it. I want to show you something to make you understand. Himmel said, setting up a a, a, a floor filled with razor spikes. Um, uh, Himmel, that looks <laughs> really dangerous. Here's some plates, but um, David, I don't think you should... This seems like it's too risky. He said, handing the plates over to Himmel, who snatched them away with a mildly irritated phrase. Think about these plates as a person. One plate, easily shattered. But if we stack the plates like you are stacking the powers of your ancestors, they become unbreakable. You must learn to not fight with the strength of yourself of one plate, but with the strength of all the plates. He's, Wait, it's just... Oh, he, said, <laughs> he said, stacking the plates, balancing 25 plates on one thin, super sharp razor. Oh my God, this is just like when I'm bussing tables, when I try to carry tables, in, when I try to carry the plates individually, sometimes I'll drop one and they'll break. But when I carry a whole stack, they, they, they are much stronger together. Oh my God, I think, I think I finally see what you're trying to say, Hymnal, that if I can stack my ancestors and everything that's come before me, maybe I can help defeat Faustus. David said, walking towards the first razor sharp spear and looking at the stack of plates. Excellent. Then you are ready to begin this element of your training. He said, whipping the plates at David's head in rapid succession. Whoa, 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 ha! Not a single one got me, old man. David said, moving with far greater speed than he'd ever shown before in this film. Hmm. <laughs> your training has begun, and I like what I see. Now... Let's use your training as a busboy and clean up all these broken plates. We still have much to do today. And scene. All right. <laughs> Dude, the, 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 the busboy was perfect. There we go. We tied back the busboyness with the plates. All right. So that brings us to the end of Act 2. David is starting to embrace his destiny um, as a chosen one, learning to access the power of his ancestors. Yep. And there was there was an obligatory move. oily, sweaty moments with the oh, '80s buff moments. outfit. There's a, a sweaty. It was a sweaty, sweaty act. <laughs> so now we're going to move to Act Three. Uh, we're going to continue the action, getting a little more proactive with Faustus and trying to stop the bad guys. Yeah. Playing an improv game called Blind Line. Well, we will be doing this as a scene. I have a stack. Whoops. I have a stack of cards I have collected at various speaking engagements where at- audience attendees have written down sentences or movie quotes. And periodically, um, as we're doing it, Mike will pause and say line. Um, and when he does, I will pull out one of these cards and read whatever sentence is written on there. Yeah. Um, or I will just, I'll say line myself. So audio wise, you know, when I'm reading from a card versus what I'm talking. And then whatever is on that, whatever we say, we have to then, justify and incorporate into the action moving forward 
All right, so act three of David and the Mystical Sphere of Destiny. Our action picks up with um, with uh, uh, Hymnal, David, and Sandy standing around a table talking about their plans for what they need to do to stop Faustus. The problem here is that Faustus knows where the sphere is already. The, the, the only good news is that Faustus is unable to open the ward without getting the Hammer of Breaking. Once he gets the Hammer of Breaking, he'll be able to enter the warded area, and then the Sphere of Destiny will be completely available for him to take. Well, then our plan seems pretty obvious, I guess. We'll just have to go and get the Hammer first um, before Faustus, and uh, then his plan will be thwarted forever. I was thinking of that. The problem is, the Hammer of Breaking is held in the Museum of Modern Art's brand new weapon exhibit, and so it's highly, highly um, um, guarded with all sorts of state-of-the-art technology. Oh my god! What, a, what an amazing coincidence! We were so busy sweatily training, we didn't have a chance to talk, but I work at the museum! So I can't get us, I can't get, I don't work in the, um, the armory, but I can get us in um, through the back door. Fantastic. Uh, let's go there right now, and we'll start breaking in to get the hammer of breaking. All right, but David, Sandy, the one thing you need to remember before you go and on, embark on this task is Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the Fandango? Because you must remember that the Fandango is the 10th the level of martial arts graceful dancing, that the only technique it is rumored that can defeat Faustus is the Fandango. And David, you have not yet learned that. So if you go and engage Faustus in a fight, you cannot win without the Fandango. Oh my gosh, I have to channel my French ancestor? I didn't even know I had French ancestry. You've All got right. ancestors from China and Japan and Brooklyn. Why not France? Open your mind. Stop thinking so limited, damn it. If you have a closed mind, you will lose to Faustus and the world will end. <laughs> right. Excellent. Sandy, let's go get to the museum and get the hammer of breaking before uh, Faustus does. The camera wipes to a scene across from the Museum of Modern Art, and you see Faustus along with a small group of henchmen, 15 stories up, 10 stories up, looking down upon the opening to the Museum of Modern Art. The hammer is inside the weapons room in that museum. Okay, boss. Well, well, why don't we just walk on in and take it then? Bolo, you idiot! Oh. We must be very cautious, for no, no weapon of man can destroy me. You all are not so fortunate, and if we don't get the hammer now, they may move it to a more secure area, which even someone with my considerable power okay. will find difficult to attain. All right, well then, before we go in there and I bring my troops, I need to make sure I prepare for this line. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. So I have to get as many things trying to hurt me so that by the time I get to the hammer of breaking, I'm as tough as possible. Okay, so we're going to start by jumping off this 10-story building, and that way all of us that live will be that much tougher. Very well, Bolo. You are the one servant I know I can trust. Go, jump off this building, and if you survive, you'll get more power. In fact, I will give you some of my power. And then you, you must kill Anyone, you must kill the woman. You can kill the old man if possible, but you must leave the boy to me. As he says that, Faustus turns his head and sees the uh, Sandy and David walking into the front door of, of the MoMA. Hey, boss, it looks like they're already here. We better get going. The, the eight henchmen jump off the roof and in true wuxia fashion start running down the side of the wall, touching the wall to slow their sense, to, to slow their descent. As they hit the ground, they land with a light touch and a flash of orange light. <sighs> I can't believe it worked. In fact, line, it's better to live one day as a lion than die than a than hundred as a lamb. I'm a lion now. Hey, boss, I'm a lion now. Very good. Very good job. I'm impressed with you. Now go use your lion status and get the hammer of breaking and destroy the girl and capture the boy. We'll, we'll do that. Hey, Bolo, I'm feeling so amazing. I never thought, line, yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. yippee ki -yay, motherfucker. I never thought I'd feel like Bruce Willis from Die Hard, but I do. I'm ready to take this place on, just like the Nakatomi Plaza. Let's go. Let's go kill everyone. I mean, except the boy. Let's kill everyone, and let's destroy everything. I am a lion, and you are a Bruce Willis. We can do anything. <laughs> the scene cuts back to Sandy and David. Sandy has gotten them past the opening guard, and they're now walking into the Museum of Modern Art back towards the weapon exhibit. 
okay, David, the weapon exhibit is right through that door. Now, the alarm is on a little bit of a delay because a lot of times people like us will set it. So there's, you have about a minute once you get in there. But there's one thing you must remember when you open that door. What's that? <laughs> I will never be a morning person for the moon. And I, you and I, oh, I will never be a morning person for the moon and I are too much in love. Oh my God, the alarm's triggered by moonlight? Yes, because people only ever break in at night. So if the moonlight hits it, and I love the moon, so I spent a lot of time in there waiting for the moonlight. So as soon as the moonlight hits it, that alarm is going to go off. All right. Well, I'll have to think of something, okay? Let me open the door and see what's going on here. The door opens, showing the hall of exhibit and various alarm lasers kind of reflecting off. Oh, Sandy, if I walk through here, I'm going to be reflecting those lasers right up and up to the moon and the moon back into the lasers. I've got to find something that can that can reflect these lasers away from the moonlight or protect the moonlight from hitting the lasers. Line. I don't like cricket. I love it. I don't like cricket. I love it. And you know what blocks moonlight? Wood. <laughs> David pulls out his old cricket bat. I never thought I'd need this, but I think I will. Whoa. So you had a cricket bat in your pocket this whole time i thought you were just happy to see me <laughs> i'm a man of surprises sandy david begins walking holding the cricket back back and forth and slowly sliding it around to break the lasers but reflect the moonlight away from the lasers i think it's working sandy i'm getting closer okay oh my god david look out right above you there's the only thing constant in life is change They've changed the security system in here. I was wrong. It's not moonlight. It's motion. The alarms are about to go off. Oh, my God. Uh, I've, I'll freeze. I'll freeze for a second and figure out what to do. Uh, I know. I've got an idea. Line. I'll have what she's having. I'll have what she's having. <laughs> David points at uh, a statue of a women samurai wielding a big katana. I need that. That katana, if I can throw it fast, the motion sensors will, will be distracted by the speed, and I'll have just enough time to get the... Uh, hammer. David reaches over and whacks the katana with his uh, uh, cricket bat, sending it spinning across the, the side. All the sensors begin to pivot and follow the katana, giving David 1.5 seconds to run 30 feet, get the hammer, and run back out. Oh my god, David, you are so fast! Yeah, you're fast, but are you strong? Bolo and the other henchmen have entered the room. Bolo looks at David and says, Do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> Do you feel lucky? Because now the alarm's going to go off and nothing can kill me because I'm a lion, but you're going to get arrested, you fool. David's face hardens. He's like, I do feel lucky. And suddenly you begin to see mystical green energy begin to course through him as he starts to sprint towards the hammer, moving faster than a mortal man, moving faster than five mortal men. He's able to quickly run, vault with a kung fu kick, land at the hammer, grab it, and begin to run back all of a sudden before the alarms even go off. Whoa, he moves so fast I couldn't even see him. Listen, let's just let's just kill the girl. At least we'll get half the plan done. As David tur turns to see them start to run towards the girl, he slows down and the alarms trip. Ah, no, stay away from her. I'll tell you this. Line. <laughs> Sorry, no soup for you. No soup for you. As he grabs a giant, uh, the giant ladle from a giant pan, a pot of soup on one of the displays, and smashes the ladle across one of the uh, uh, bad guy's uh, faces, knocking him senseless and driving him back 15 feet. Suddenly, the bad guys turn and they all whip out various pieces of cutlery, spoons, knives, forks. And it's a mighty battle. But Sandy, not to be outdone, turns and kicks Bolo in the groin, knocking him down. Oh, I can't believe you hit me. The last person who did that. We can only control what we can control, and that's our positive outlook and can-do attitude. So no matter, even though you punch me in the groin, I'm going to be positive. I'm a lion. It didn't kill me. I am stronger. Suddenly, Bolo stands up, and he's actually been imbued with Faust's powers, and he grows two feet, his muscles bulging almost like the Hulk, and he suddenly looks down at David. I am going to crush you now. David takes a step back and falls into a ready stance. Suddenly, fists come whistling down at David. David stepping to the left, stepping to the right, moving faster than he ever saw, thought possible. Crackling green energy is moving around him as he starts to feel other voices inside his head telling him, raise your hand here, move here, drop here. Different accents, different tones floating through him. Suddenly, one of the voices says, as the kick from Bolo fires at his face, that says, line. 
If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. David thinks to himself, I knew I had a Brooklyn ancestor. As the foot comes whistling, David drops to the ground, grabs one of the fallen forks, and stabs upward, stabbing poor Bolo right in the groin again with a cheap oh. low blow. <laughs> Oh, that hurts so bad. Suddenly the alarms start blaring. David grabs Sandy's hand and says, let's get the hell out of here. But he looks and he doesn't see the hammer anywhere. Ho, ho, ho. Is this what you're looking for, boy? Let me tell you something. Faustus has appeared, holding the hammer in his hand. Let me tell you something, boy. That's the life you chose. The life of the line was the line that's the life <laughs> yeah, yeah. of the ordinary the bus boy the lawyer but this is guaranteeing me to get the sphere of destiny Faustus just steps back and, and uh, orange smoke begins to swirl around him david cries out no you will not take the, the hammer of breaking and, and confront the sphere of destiny and charges at uh, Faustus, raining down punches Faust is contemptuously blocking each of them with his hand. You have not come into your full training yet, boy. In fact, I only see one thing from this fight, line. Bueller? 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 Him saying mockingly as his single hand parries all of David's uh, David's uh, strikes. Just like Bueller in the movie, you are not even present here. You are absent from this fight. Uh, having said, he reaches up and lightning quick snatches Dave's throat and picks him three feet off the ground. David writhing, trying to grip at his throat. G I can't breathe. I can't. Line. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. You can take this stupid hammer of breaking. You're clearly too powerful for me. I'm just gonna give up. Ha ha. I knew it to be true, silly boy. Himnal has taught you nothing. Oh, I taught him a thing or two. Himnal has appeared sitting there. In fact, Faustus, I once had a farm in Africa. <gasps> this factoid suddenly puts a wave of shock on Faustus's mound. A farm in Africa. That was the last resting place of the bone. <gasps> that was your farm. Oh, old man, you're trying to set me up. Yes, yes I am, because now you understand the truth of where I came from and where this will all end. When next we meet, it shall not be you with the with the hammer of breaking trying to get the sphere of destiny. It shall be you with the hammer of breaking fighting against all the power I bring from the farm of Africa. And let it be said that I shall rain down the the, the I shall rain down the African fury on you, just like the song from Toto. <laughs> Hymnal raises his hands and suddenly transforms into mist again, but the mist forms into a cloud which rains down, rain imbuing all going into David. All of Hymnal's energy and all the ancestors had gone inside David who uses that power to grab the hand to release his throat. Shoving Faustus back, David says to Faustus, Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Faustus steps back in shock and fear. Not that line. Not that line. I can't fight the power of the most perfectly crafted introduction to a fight ever. I shall see you another time, small boy. I have now, I now only have to fear you, for Hymnal is gone. Faustus swirls his sword into a giant arc, and the, and the, the orange smoke transcends him, and he vanishes in a poof of smoke. And that ends act three of our story. I can't hope to stand against the greatest introduction to a fight ever. That is, I stand by it. That is the greatest introduction to a fight ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is a good line. So where All we're right, at right that now. That brings us to the end of act three. Yeah, if I, where if, Faustus has the yep. hammer of breaking. Right. Himnal right. is gone, but he has imbued his powers and the ancestors into David who is just starting to learn, although he still hasn't fully understood and embraced his power. Right. right, and now the only thing left to do is defend the the sphere of destiny where it's located from Faustus, armed now with the hammer of breaking. Yes. So this is brings us to the final fourth act of our story, and we're going to play the improv game Cutting Room, where uh, we will start with a two-person scene or a three-person, whatever scene. At any point, Mike, and, Mike or I can clap our hands and say cut to whatever scene. Um, could be in the past, the present, completely out of the movie, just randomness, whatever. Mm -hmm. And eventually this will take us to the resolution and ending of our movie. By the way, I have to just say something random before we jump in. I now have firmly mentally projected that Sandy is being played by Kim Cattrall. I don't know why. <laughs> that's there you like, go. Uh, big trouble little China. Oh, so that's what it is. So yeah, yeah. I'm like, why is Kim Cattrall in my head right now? She is. All right. Uh, never a bad thing. Yes. All right. So 
act for the fourth and final act of David and the Mystical Sphere of Destiny. Our scene begins back at the warehouse where David and Sandy are talking, um, lamenting the loss of Hymnal and wondering what to do next. I can't believe he's gone. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not strong enough to defeat Faustus, David says as he's looking down at the map of the city during which a big circle is drawn showing where the um, Sphere of Destiny is located. David, I know Hymnal, I know he was tough, but over these past few days, he really formed a connection with you. But listen, I saw what happened. He sacrificed himself so that you could get his power and the power of his ancestors. And I know you don't think you can do it without him, but he's always going to be there with you. You're right. And you know, it's my job. I have to defend our city, our world, from the evil Dr. Faustus. I don't think I'm ready for it, but I have to be prepared to do what I can. All right, let's go over to the Sphere of Destiny and try and protect it from Faustus and the hymnal and the, and the Hammer of Breaking. Hey, David, I'll be right there with you. But you know, according to Hymnal's plans here, we have about 45 minutes before we need to go. <laughs> Cut to some sensual sax music and some really cool backlit 80s stuff. <laughs> Cut to 14 minutes later. <laughs> Oh, David, I, I, uh, I knew when you embraced that green energy, you'd be fast, but I didn't know you'd be that fast. <laughs> yeah, I'm generating, I'm discovering all sorts of new powers that I didn't think I had before. <laughs> Cut to 20 minutes later when they're back and dressed. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know about you, but I feel ready to take on the world. Yeah, me too. Let's get, let's get after this right now. Cut to Faustus uh, looking at the map in his lair and getting ready for the final attack on the Sphere of Destiny and the breaking into it. Bolo, though you've been defeated and had a fork in your crotch, you have not died. You are with me. We need, we have the hammer, so you serve me well. We need to go here and destroy and get the sphere of destiny with the hammer of breaking. Okay, we'll do that. And I'm going to bring as many guards as I can because I don't trust for a moment this is going to be easy. I'm thinking I've got 40, maybe 50 people that'll help defend this area while you're getting the sphere of destiny. Cut to Bolo interviewing potential guards to join uh, his henchman team. So, uh, we've got a little uh, four-hour gig. You're going to be paid time and a half, and basically you have to go protect a giant maniacal warlord from usurping the greatest cosmic energy in the world from a guy who's channeling about 5,000 warriors in his veins. Uh, and we have dental. Oh, look, I don't care about any of that. Just, are you guys going to pay $15 an hour or not? Oh, sure. And dental. Sign here. All right, thank you. <laughs> cut to the guy who didn't make the cut. And we're paying $15 an hour, and we have dental. $15 an hour? I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with an engineering degree. I taught martial arts there. I have a black belt, damn it. What the hell? I'm the most qualified candidate you're going to meet. I need $35 an hour. I want dental. I want the good dental, okay? Not the PPO dental you're trying to get me on. And listen, I need my weekends off, right, because I got things to do. Yeah, uh, we're kind of looking for a person with a certain kind of attitude and style. We'll be in touch. Cut back to cut back to Faustus and the army outside the ward of protection with the hammer of breaking. All right. With this hammer, finally the ward will be down. We will get the sphere of destiny, and I will ascend to godhood. And Hymnal will him knowing his ancestors and his descendants will never plague me ever again. Faustus walks forward and begins smashing the giant blue ward with the hammer of breaking. Every time he's done, crackles of energy and cracks start to go through this. Um, at this moment, David and Sandy appear, uh, seeing this attack on the ward. Faustus, I am here for you. Though you think you've defeated me once, I am now ready to face you, he says, pulling out um, Hymnal's staff and holding it up to show Faustus. Cut to Thor at this exact moment in time. <laughs> hey, uh, Freya? I thought I put my hammer in the bathroom last night. Where is it? Oh, you did put it in the bathroom last night, but I have told you so many times about cleaning up with yourself, so I am teaching you a lesson. And be lucky the only lesson is me saying that, because last time your father tried to teach you a lesson, he sent you down as a crippled doctor. So you're getting off lightly this time, mister. Oh, my God. I am going to be in so much trouble if I can't find this hammer. Oh, you, just, you just hope I don't tell Lady Sif about this. <laughs> 
cut back to the fight between David and, and Faustus. So, boy, you wish to fight me with both my sword and now the hammer of breaking. As uh, Faustus lunges forward, quick jumping 15 feet in the air and sp spinning his blade to a false grip, smashing down the ground with a big blowout of energy. Yeah, well, I've learned a lot since our last meeting, Faustus, and with hymnal staff and the power of my ancestors, I'm finally ready to face you. The two fight, clashing, clang, hammer against staff, sword against staff, back and forth. Cut to the, uh, to the, to the henchman at this point in time. Oh, hey, look, look, the girl's over there. I don't know what's going on with Faustus. He told us not to mess with the guy anyways, but we can still kill the girl. Yeah, let's go do it. Let's go Let's go do that right now. <laughs> Cut back to David watching, the, watching them go towards the girl in the fight scene. <gasps> oh, no, Sandy, I need to protect her. <laughs> oh, distracted, David gets whapped in the face with the hammer and falls backwards. Suddenly a voice appears in Daniel's head, or in David's head, <laughs> in David's head, saying, remember, it's not important to, to take the hit. It's important to not be there where the hit when the hit happens. Okay, I gotta figure out what the hell that means. <laughs> the next blow coming in. David closes his eyes and becomes a wisp of smoke, just like Hymnal did, and appears behind Faustus. Bro, where did you go, small puny mortal? How did you learn that magic? Uh, I'm learn. I have learned much, and I continue to learn more. David says, whapping Faustus in the face with a staff. A new voice. A new voice uh, uh, appears in David's head that says, "Remember, it's not important to hit once. It's important to hit a thousand times. When you find the moment, leverage it and hit as many times as you can." Faustus steps back, uh, watching David as David flicks forward with the staff. What are you doing? You're working through my defenses. As the staff whips around, tapping him on various spots of the upper arms and the body, uh, Faustus is trying to swing his heavy sword, but the staff is too quick and starts getting past his defenses. Oh, 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 stop, stop. Suddenly, Faustus yells, Bolo, henchman, help me. David turns oh, okay, to see. Boss. Okay, can we kill him? Can we kill him? Yes, kill him immediately. Kill him immediately. David turns and turns around as suddenly 40 to 50 henchmen start charging at him. Dave whips his staff down, slams it to the ground, and jumps off it with a flying kick, punching through three henchmen and sending them flying 15 feet back. David is furiously whipping around, knocking him back, but he's slowly starting to get overwhelmed because there are just so many of them. Suddenly, he hears a car engine and a... Uh -uh. It's Sandy behind the wheel of a truck that she is driving, and she plows into the henchman. Take that, you guys. You guys think you can kidnap me and kill me? Well, I'm going to run over you over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David turns and, and, and tips his, his brow to Sandy, who smiles back and waves at him. Go get him. Go get him, David. You protect that sphere of destiny. David turns to see there's still 25 henchmen coming at him. As they come at him, suddenly David hears another voice in his head saying, Clench your fists. And open your open your heart. David clenches his fist and dreams, thinks of the things he loves, thinks of Sandy, thinks of Hymnal, thinks of his dojo mates. And as he thinks of his dojo mates, suddenly five wisps of smoke appear, and his fellow dojo mates appear. Thomas, Thomas, I'm sorry to bring you into this, but can you help me? Of course. Well, what do you need help with? Whoa, there's a lot of guys charging at us, Thomas says. He quickly falls back and starts throwing a flurry of punches and kicks. David says, no time to waste. You've got to help me stop these 25 henchmen. Over the henchmen, you can see Faustus slowly lumbering towards the sphere of destiny as he's crashing his hammer through the, through the ward. David jumps 15 feet in the air, backflips, and lands on two of the henchmen. He knocks him aside. And he starts moving towards Faustus, but there's still henchmen. And Faustus is reaching his arm forward, about to grab the Sphere of Destiny, when suddenly Sandy leaps on his back and starts clawing his eyes out. Says, you bastard, I may not be the chosen one, but I'm not going to let you get the Sphere of Destiny. Sandy, no, David cries as he starts running towards him. He suddenly hears a voice in his head saying, sometimes the straightest path is not the most direct path. <sighs> David pauses, meditates, and yells out, I understand! And he suddenly runs away from Faustus and the henchmen. The henchmen are all confused. Why is he running away? But then David turns into a wisp of smoke and appears on the other side of the henchmen, just like he did with Faustus. Suddenly there's nothing between him and the evil lord. Cut to all the voices in David's head during this entire section. Turn into a wisp of smoke. Teleport! Fight! Um, take a break, man. You look tired. Oh, David, I can't believe you're the chosen one. You are the, the most disappointing nephew I ever had. <laughs> Come back to the fight. <laughs> oh, Faustus rah, leaves. Sandy goes tumbling off of him, banging her head and falling unconscious. Now there's nothing to stop me from getting the Sphere of Destiny. David says, 
only one thing. And suddenly he walks right in front of Faustus between him and the glowing sphere of destiny. David rips up <coughs> his shirt, showing the circular tattoo on his chest. Faustus steps back. The sign, the omen, you possess it. In 10,000 generations, no one has shown the omen. Cut to Richard Donner trying to pitch the omen, even though no one has looked at an omen in 10,000 years. All right, listen, I got this great idea for a horror movie. It's going to be about a kid um, who's the devil. It's called The Omen. All right, so it's going to be a uh, movie like uh, Friday the 13th, where the devil comes around and kills everybody, right? No, 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 it's about a kid, about a kid, and this stuff just happens. Uh, so what, like the kid like gets in trouble, like stops burglars from coming into the house or something, like drops paint cans on him? No, 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 that's a stupid cause for a movie. That would never, no, no, the kid is the devil, but he doesn't know he's the yeah, devil. Yeah, all kids are the devil, buddy. Come on, what's the hook here? I'm, I'm trying I'll, to figure I'll, it out I'll, here. Right, you know what? I'm going to Warner Brothers. <laughs> Cut to David finally assuming his full power. <sighs> oh, now my ancestors, even that one aunt who was always disappointed in me, and him no, Faustus, I finally have the power to defeat you. No, it's not possible. Faustus rears his sword back and slams it down onto David's skull. David reaches up and catches the blade in his bare hand. Oh, boy, you may have stopped my sword, but you may have power, but you haven't wielded it for a millennia like I have. They struggle, Faustus pushing the sword closer and closer to David's head, when suddenly a voice goes in David's head. Remember, David, do the Fandango, do the Fandango. Suddenly, David moves to the side and begins speaking in a French accent. He starts scuttling around, doing this intricate dance. You can almost hear the accordion music playing. Faust, what? What is this? What are you doing? What's with this strange timing? I can't seem to figure out how to hit you. That's right, you can't, because I know the one truth. My ancestors have taught me the Fandango, and now I will use it to defeat you. As David dances, ar dances around, the circle on his chest begins to glow brighter and brighter and brighter, until finally a bright light shoots out into Faustus. No, no, it's not true. It's my destiny. Parts of Faustus begin flaking off as David dancing comes in and with lightning dance moves starts punching Faustus in rhythm to his dance, knocking parts of Faustus off of his, his rapidly decomposing uh, energized, energized corpse. Faustus' body starts to disintegrate. He looks up and says, this isn't over, Himnal. This is over. <laughs> Faustus explodes into a... In a energy and, and huge wave of concussive force, knocking the, the surviving henchmen back. The smoke clears, showing David kneeling down in a classic Marvel kneeling hero stance, standing up, and the camera moves in, showing his, his chest circular omen fading back to the normal tattoo that it was. And as it fades, the sphere of destiny lifts off its pedestal and floats into the circle that's on David's chest, inside him, thus uniting David with the sphere of destiny. Camera fades to black and fades up seven days later. Oh, David, I can't believe it's all over. I've been worried the last week that something would happen, but I think, I think you did it. I think you defeated Faustus and saved the world. I think I understand what my role is now. Not only am I the protector of the sphere, I'm the protector of the next generation. I've decided I'm not going back to law school. The dojo needs me. They need me to teach the next generation of protectors. All right, I'm off to teach. I'll see you, honey, when I get back from teaching, and uh, maybe we'll go catch dinner and a movie. Yeah, maybe we'll stay in and catch dinner and a movie. Mm. David walks out, finishes the bite of his cantaloupe, and puts it down. As he walks out, you see the cantaloupe brine sitting there, and suddenly sparks of orange energy begin to disturb the, the unmoving cantaloupe. The end. Oh! <laughs> Do we actually pull off, like, legitimately describing combat in an improv context? I think, so. I think, I think we did. The <laughs> listeners are be the judge of that. Uh, but that is our show. Oh. Um, let us know how, what you thought. You can go to um, avishandmike.com. You can, you can comment on the post uh, on the episode there. If you did like it, we would really love it if you would go to iTunes, give us a five-star review uh, rating, and leave a short review. That really helps others find us. Go to avishandmike.com, sign up there. You can enter suggestions for future movies. And if you would help us out, um, if you like this episode, go ahead and share it. Go to your favorite social media platform, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and just share and let people know that, hey, this is a show worth listening to. We would appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. So thank you all very much. 
Um, hopefully you had as much fun listening to this episode as we did performing it. Absolutely. That was awesome, man. So Avish, thanks again for a great run. Uh, I will see you next week. And uh, man, thank you all for listening and, and following us on this wild journey. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you, Mike. And we will see you next week.